welcome back. In this section, we are going to be talking a whole bunch of little things that all of which have clinical applications. So I think you'll really like this part. The first thing I want to talk about is something called DOMS, which you may have heard about if you've ever been a gym rat, which stands for delayed onset muscle soreness. So if you ever have done a good workout, you will walk out at the end of your workout and you go, oh gosh, I can feel that. That feels great. You can tell you've had a good workout. That's not this. This happens either 12, 24, up to 48 hours later. And it's different for different people. Like for instance, for me, it happens about 24 hours after a good workout, whereas for my daughter, it would happen about 36 hours after a workout, which meant she needed to work out at night because 36 hours after a morning workout means she couldn't sleep at night. Whereas I was much better at working out in the morning because my soreness would be in the morning, not at night. So what is happening when you are doing these workouts and when you're like building your muscle, you are actually causing these microscopic tears in your muscle. This has nothing to do with lactic acid, that burn that your grade school PE teacher told you to work through. That was bad. That burn meant you had lactic acid, which means you needed to breathe. You didn't have any oxygen, so you need to stop contracting your muscle for a second, take a couple of breaths, and then restart. All right. But let's get back to delayed onset muscle soreness. If you look at the picture in the bottom right, I think you clearly can see some Z lines over here all lined up, or A bands, and I bands, beautiful. Whereas within the red circle, I think you can see like, man, that's funky looking, not the way it's supposed to be. And so this myocyte has some significant damage. So if you remember those myosatellite cells, which are hanging around, just waiting to do stuff, this is their job to fix this. And what happens is this muscle cell will be stronger and bigger than ever afterwards. So when this damage happens, that gives you an inflammatory reaction. And just like if you twist your ankle and you get inflammatory reaction, you get that swelling and the fluid going into the area, the same thing happens here. So go to a workout, you have a little bit of soreness, whatever muscle group you're working out. Run a marathon or 10K or a half marathon. If any of you have ever done that, you may have realized, oh, 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 I hurt so much. I have a flight of stairs in my house or get up to my apartment. And it hurts so much to get up there. And you go, oh, I exercised for two and a half hours. I bet I lost five pounds. And you go on the scale the next day, you find out you've gained weight because of all this swelling going to where all this microscopic damage is. So that's just what that is. It's just part of the process of working out and building new muscle. So we live in Southern California. So let's talk about Botox for a second. So Botox is a poison that you are paying somebody to inject in your body and you are keeping your fingers crossed that it doesn't kill you. And what Botox does, it prevents acetylcholine from being released into the synaptic clef. So it's up there in the synaptic vesicle, but it keeps it from being released. And so normally when you get a Botox injection, you, because you don't have the acetylcholine being released and the muscle can't contract. And normally this wears off after about six weeks, okay? And so you can see the typical places up here where your forehead, I just call them, you know, the wrinkles that go with the wisdom. Um, but wherever they inject it, you're not gonna have those wrinkles because you can't contract the muscles. So here are two beautiful pictures of Hillary Clinton. The one on the left, you can see the wrinkles. The one on the right, she looks a good 10 years younger, doesn't she? Except that picture was taken two years after the one on the left. So don't tell me she didn't have Botox because you clearly can see the lack of wrinkles on that one. She definitely had Botox and maybe some fluid or something else. Which brings me to something else. Yeah. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. You're just fine the way you are. Be kind to your bodies. All right, so what do you need to get off of this page? Botox prevents acetylcholine exocytosis. That's how it works. 
and function usually returns in four to six weeks. All right, myasthenia gravis. Hopefully that's a disease you've heard about before. It's really common in women, often diagnosed um, while they're still in college or right after they get married and start having a family. This is an autoimmune disease, which means your body makes antibodies which attack cells in your body that for some reason it thinks it's foreign. And the cells that are being attacked actually aren't cells. The part of your body being attacked in myasthenia are the acetylcholine receptors. So if you go back to the motor end plate where you have 10,000 acetylcholine receptors, that's where you're gonna be seeing all the damage. So when you have the loss of receptors, then what's, then it doesn't matter if acetylcholine is released. We need to have a receptor for two acetylcholines to bind to to start this whole muscle contraction process. And if the receptor is not there, you can't do that. And so as the receptors are being destroyed, the amount of acetylcholine receptors able to be bound to acetylcholine, those numbers are going well down. So you start getting muscle weakened. That's um, weakened. So the way that we treat it is to give medicines that prevent the acetylcholine esterase from breaking down the acetylcholine. So it hangs out there and has a second chance to bind again. So what do you need to know about this? Well, look at the pictures because it sort of explains it, but this is auto an autoimmune disease where antibodies are attacking acetylcholine receptors the next disease is tetanus this is the one you get immunizations for it's by an organism called clostridium tetani you don't have to know that but this organism which is on the right looks like those little old school tennis rackets um, produces a poison that it releases now did you ever hear a grandmother say, don't walk outside barefoot, you might step on a rusty nail and get tetanus? Okay. It has nothing to do with the fact that there's rust on the nail. Okay. This organism is in dirt everywhere. It's in your house because you walk in shoes inside your house. It is everywhere. The whole thing about the rusty nail is number one, the nail is rusty because it's sitting outside so it gets oxidized. But when you step on a nail, what happens is you get a puncture wound. And when you get a puncture wound, that means it's deep with a really small opening and that opening seals in about 24 hours. Meanwhile, the organisms are inside. So there's no oxygen going into where the organisms are. And this is an organism that only grows in the absence of oxygen. So once it's sealed after 24 hours, it starts making lots of its poison. And what its poison does, if you look at this drawing, pause it and look at it, it blocks a blocker. So it's preventing muscles from relaxing. So what does this look like? So for instance, everybody contract your diaphragm and inhale. Don't exhale. Contract your diaphragm and inhale again. Don't exhale because you can't relax. Contract your diaphragm and inhale again. Don't exhale. Do you see how this is gonna be a difficult problem really quickly? Yes. So that was just one muscle, your diaphragm. Imagine that to all your skeletal muscles. And I think you can understand that this is a picture would look like with somebody that has tetanus. So how can you prevent yourself from having tetanus? Well, don't walk barefoot and step on rusty nails. Well, just don't have rusty nails in your backyard, but you know it. There's lots of times we'll skin our knees, the organisms in the dirt, whatever. Get your tetanus shot. So tetanus immunizations, your antibodies against this do not last your entire life, okay? Your antibody levels really plummet around 10 years. So you need a booster shot every 10 years. So when you start school, you needed to have this. They checked this. You had it when you were very young. So 10 years later is around middle school. That's the last time they checked whether or not your tetanus was up to date. You usually have to get a booster in middle school. Has it been 10 years from middle school? It's time for you to get a booster. You don't have to wait until you cut yourself. Okay. Just go to your doctor, 
take your shot record or ask your doctor, look at my shot record. When was the last time I had a tetanus booster? If it's been nine years, just say, hey, man, can I have my tetanus booster before I cut myself, before I die of tetanus? Because here's the thing. If you wait until you cut yourself and go to the emergency room for stitches or whatever, and they ask you, when's your last tetanus? You go, I don't know, middle school. You have to start the whole series again, which means you have to have three shots. Do you want three or do you want one? Yeah, go for the one that you get every 10 years. All right, so tetanus, what do you have to know? Blocks a blocker, which prevents relaxation. So botulism, it's okay, we're all poor. Have you been to that part of the grocery store where they sell the ding cans and you're tempted? Oh my God, this is usually 10 bucks and they have it for sale for $1.50, don't. If you're coming home when you drop a can and you dent it, fine. Otherwise, don't. Because remember that organism that you inject yourself for Botox? That same organism gives you botulism. And so that organism won't grow unless there is a microscopic crack in here. And what this does, it's the same thing it did up here prevents acetylcholine from being released from that synaptic vesicle. So that's all you need from there. Why do I have a picture of a baby with honey? Because a lot of parents who don't know better dip babies' pacifiers into honey because they love them and it shuts them up and then they fall asleep. But honey naturally contains small amounts of this bacteria. Fine for you as an adult, not fine for an infant. Their immune system cannot handle it and they can die from botulism. All right, let's talk some more exotic but really interesting things. Cobra. All right, so if you ever read um, about the mongoose and um, the cobra and how the mongoose could kill the cobra, did you all read that? Jungle Book? Yeah, it's true. Okay, so. Cobra ven venom contains something called a bungarotoxin, which basically in our body, we have different types of acetylcholine receptors and this toxin binds to one of those. And so that's what the picture on the top right is, where the green is showing this thing that the cobra venom has. It's binding to one of the types of acetylcholine receptor, which then means when the synaptic vesicle releases the acetylcholine, there's no place for the acetylcholine to bind because there's already something sitting in there. And so if acetylcholine can't bind, then those channels can't open, we can't have sodium go in, we can't have our action potential, we can't have muscle contraction. So that gives a paralysis. So getting back to the jungle book and the mongoose, the acetylcholine receptors on the mongoose do not have the same shape that they do in the human. And because of that, the cobra venom bungarotoxin can't bind to it. And so if the cobra bites the mongoose, it just pisses off the mongoose. It doesn't kill it. All right, so what do you need to know? A competitive inhibition to prevent acetylcholine from binding. All right, curare. You've all heard of this. Go out in the jungle, you get whatever this curare plant, which is... Um, shown in the picture on the far right, it's a vine that grows up and kind of kills the trees that it's growing on. And what this is, is this also binds to one type of acetylcholine receptor. However, when it binds to it, this binding is reversible. The cobra venom one, irreversible. Once it's bound, acetylcholine can never bind. This one at the same one, it will bind to it, which prevents acetylcholine. However, it doesn't kill you. So it paralyzes your muscles. So that means if you're gonna be shot with a curare dart, make sure you have somebody there who can do CPR, you've got the ventilator or the bag, and so they can sit there and they can ventilate you for a good hour. Um, so that you can have adequate oxygenation of your tissues because in about an hour's time, a usual dose of this will wear off and then you will be fine. 
Now, that being said, there's not a whole lot of CPR going on in the jungles. So if you're shot with a poison dart with curaris, odds are that's the end. So as opposed to the cover venom, which was an irreversible binding to acetylcholine receptor, so acetylcholine could not bind, this is a reversible binding to the acetylcholine receptor. So it's a temporary binding. All right. Our friend, the pufferfish, aren't they so cute? Okay. So most of you by now have learned that like in Asia, there's places where pufferfish is a delicacy and there's special masters who deal with the pufferfish um, because it can kill you. Okay. So there is a toxin. In the pufferfish, there's little bacteria that, that live and they produce this toxin, this poison, which is not broken down by cooking, okay? A lot of our toxins are broken down by heat. This one is not, and there's no antidote to this one either. And so what happens with this is it binds to those voltage-gated sodium channels in the neuron. So the neuron before the neuromuscular junction. So this toxin is bound to the voltage-gated sodium thing. So when the action potential comes down, sodium cannot enter the neuron. So it cannot continue down. So you will not have acetylcholine being released. You have no depolarization coming from the neuron. And this is 10,000 times deadlier than cyanide. The amount of this poison in one tiny little puffer fish, and by tiny, I mean they're like this big when they're not puffed up, can kill 30 humans. And we have known about this since the 1700s with Captain James Cook when they first realized it. Um, it killed all their pigs that they had on the ship. Luckily, um, it didn't kill their sailors because their sailors weren't really consuming the puffer fish. I think they had just given to the pigs. And so the sailors were just like, it was the stuff they had on their hands. So they had um, minimal symptoms. Like they got sick, but they didn't die. All right. So puffer fish blocks neuron, neurono, sorry, sodium channel preventing the depolarization. Poison dart frogs, these are so cute. They come in all kinds of colors. Some of them are as tiny as your fingernails, like that little yellow one. Other ones are like two to three inches, okay? So there's more than 100 species of these. And it's interesting because we've only known about these for about 50 years, but we've really discovered a lot about them. So behind their ears and on their back, they have this gland that produces a toxin there. And what this does, it activates those sodium channels, which means you are going to have a constant influx of sodium, a persistent depolarization. And this is even more toxic than the puffer fish because one frog can kill 50 humans. It's one of these tiny little guys, tiny little frog killing 50 people. All right. Sarin nerve gas. All right. So, you know, we've had sarin gas at, um, attacks. It, they're especially popular. I don't he hesitate to use that word in subway systems. And the reason for that is that you don't have an influx of fresh air to wash it out. So the gas kills a maximum amount of people. Okay. And what this is, is this inhibits the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, thereby keeping acetylcholine in the synapses. Okay, so go ahead and follow through this little pathway there. And so acetylcholine stays in the synapse. You're going to have more binding to the acetylcholine receptor. So the receptor is continually firing. So you're getting action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, you know, and that can put you in clonus depending on the timing of it. So fun facts about sarin, it's odorless, it's tasteless, it's colorless. We have no, it kills you within just a couple of minutes. And whether you inhale it, whether you contact it with the skin or you ingest it, all three of them are fatal. Some of them are fatal faster than others. And we have known about gases and used them in warfare. And I'll be showing you an example later on. The electric eel. Cool animal, but it's actually a fish. It's not an eel. 
if we look in the tail, there's what we call an electric organ down there. There's all these cells that form this C shape in the tail, okay? So all these cells make the electric eel form this C shape. And when the electric eel has the C shape, we have negative charges from the tail area and positive charges for the head area. And so if a little poor fishy comes between the two, it's like electric field. Only it's much faster, 500 pulses per second, okay? And so what's happening, it's opening sodium channels causing continuous muscle contractions. And so when you look at the little prey, if you look at the graph on the right, in the red that's showing you the voltage, so just imagine there's 500 of those in a second, and on the bottom is showing what's happened to the muscle, so the, mus the sodium channels on the poor little dying fishies are being opened, so sodium goes through, and basically you get to that exhaustion period pretty quickly, and then that fish becomes the eel's meal. All right. What happens when you have a muscle cramp? Dehydration, iron imbalances, lactic acid, stretch it, get blood flow going on, drink fluids, okay? This is, a lot of people talk about, oh, potassium, I need a banana. But now we know it's really due to a lack of ATP, which is needed to send the calcium from the cytosol back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so the calcium, Thetosolic levels of calcium are higher, and so the muscle fibers are contracting again. Okay. So it has nothing to do with potassium. It has to do with a lack of ATP, so bring more blood flow into the area carrying oxygen. Rigor mortis. All right. So that elephant, that's a statue. It just like looks like a dead elephant lying on its side. Okay. Um, bottom right, that's a real human being who shot himself with a rifle on the left. Those are little creatures which are eaten in Asia for meal. They don't have cows, they eat these, okay? And basically what you notice, they all have, everything has stiff arms and legs sticking out. So what happens before you die is the acetylcholine goes in the cleft, the calcium is released, the muscle contracts, okay? We have the myosin head inside forming a cross bridge. What has to happen? We need a new ATP to bond. What happens when you're dead? Are you making any ATP? You're kind of dead, aren't you? Are you breathing? Are you able to make any ATP? Is there any blood flowing? Yeah, no, there's no ATP happening. So there's no muscle relaxation going to happen. All right, so why do I have this picture? I have this because on the left, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. All three of these diseases are associated with problems with motor movement. But all of these, and in fact, more than 85% of muscle movement diseases are actually related to neuron problems. These diseases which I've shown here are neurological diseases. Muscular dystrophy on the right, that's a muscle disease. But by far, if somebody ha is having a muscle problem, it's much more likely to be due to a neurological problem than a primary muscle problem. All right, so hopefully as I went along, I told you the one tiny little tidbit you needed to get away. I from each slide. I hope you enjoyed this part. And so you, you saw like here is clinical applications of the information we learn and hopefully it all makes sense now. So thank you so much for working hard. I know muscles are really difficult. And with this, we are done with skeletal muscle. So we will come back with one more muscle lecture and it will be both cardiac and smooth muscle in one lecture. Thank you. And I will see you again soon.